Welcome everybody to the third webinar of the GIG platform webinar series. Um, my, my name is Merlin Francis and I'm from the communication team at CSTEP. Uh, the GIG platform is a civil society initiative providing independent estimation and analysis of GIG emissions. The platform is an initiative supported by the Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation and includes consortium members CEEW, ICLE South Asia, Vasudha Foundation, WRI as well as CSTEP. CSTEP will be anchoring today's session, which will focus on trends in G India's GHG emissions against key indicators such as population, GDP, and energy. This will be followed by each of the consortium members' findings in key economic sectors such as energy, industries, waste, and the Apollo sector. A few rules before we begin. We request you to mute your computers while the webinar is in progress. Each of the partner organizations will present their findings. Um, each, each presentation will be about seven minutes. Uh, the, the webinar will then be followed by a Q&A session at the, at the end of the webinar. Um, use the chat window. There's a Q&A chat window that's available on your computers to direct questions at respective sector experts. Um, Purnima Kumar from CSTEP, uh, a research analyst at CSTEP, will begin today's uh, webinar. Um, Purnima is a research analyst at CSTEP. Her work has looked primarily at different aspects of national and international climate policy through projects such as the GHG Platform India. She is also currently looking at energy pathways for meeting India's developmental goals with a focus on housing and infrastructure. Purnima has a background in architecture. She holds a master's degree in environmental and infrastructure planning from the University of Groningen. She is currently pursuing a master's degree in carbon management from the University of Edinburgh. Before CSTEP, Purnima worked at the Center for Sustainable Technologies at IIC Bangalore. I now invite Purnima to give an overview of the platform and present CSTEP's analysis of the energy sector. Hi, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to start by telling you about the GHG Platform India. The GHG Platform India is a collective civil society initiative providing an independent estimation and analysis of India's greenhouse gas emissions across key sectors such as energy, waste, industry, and agriculture, forestry, and land use and land use change. As mentioned, the platform comprises CEEW, CSTEP, ICLE South Asia, Vasudha Foundation, CIMMYT, and WRI India, in addition to a few sectoral experts in their individual capacities. The platform was jointly conceptualized by Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation, who's our funder, and Vasudha Foundation, the platform secretariat. The GHG Platform India was formed as the culmination of processes that occurred on the sidelines of COP20 in Lima in December 2014. The first phase of the GHG Platform India looked at national emissions. This was expanded upon in the second phase, level emissions estimates from 2005 to 2013. Now, in the third phase of the GHGPI, we have expanded our time frame up to 2015. We are also assisting certain state governments with revising their SAPCCs to align with our nationally determined contribution goals. The objectives of the platform are multifold. We aim to create a starting point to track GHG emissions. We also hope to facilitate greater understanding on how GHG emission trends have evolved at both the national and state levels. In doing so, we hope to help relevant stakeholders identify opportunities to establish climate mitigation goals and in the process also showcase India's actions on climate change. In terms of data, we are attempting to address gaps in greenhouse gas data availability at the national and subnational level and also make data more accessible by making it available on a single platform. Our objective ultimately is to help inform policy dialogue and decision making. Our efforts in doing so were recently recognized by the MOEFCC in India's second biennial update report to the UNFCCC. Now, to provide broader context to our GHG emissions and our national goals to reduce them, India ratified the Paris Agreement in 2016. In our nationally determined contribution, or NDC, to the UNFCCC, we volunteered to reduce our emissions intensity of GDP by 33 to 35% over 2005 levels, achieve 40% fossil free power generation capacity, and create a carbon sink of 2.5 to 3 billion tons of CO2e by 2030. At present, our energy sector uh, emissions account for more than 70% of our overall emissions, and we are one of the top five highest GHG emitters in the world. Moving on to a broad level summary of India's GHG emissions over the past decade or so, 
our emissions have increased from about 1,500 to 2,400 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. We see that the energy sector is a key driver of emissions in India, accounting for 59% of its emissions in 2015. As a growing economy, still heavily reliant on fossil fuels, our energy sector's share in emissions have also risen, as has the industry sectors. Now we'll take a look at how India's emissions have been doing with regard to key indicators like GDP, energy, and population. Our overall emissions intensity of GDP declined between 2005 and 2015. If you look at our COP15 reduction targets for 2020, you'll see that we've achieved about 14% reduction as per our calculations. This reduction can be attributed to the influx of renewable energy and other low carbon technologies in both demand and supply sectors during this period. Our emissions per capita have increased by about 40% during this period, due largely to urbanization, rising income, and growing aspirations. At 1.87 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per capita, we're still far below the world average for 2014, which was 4.97 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per capita. Now that we've looked at key indicators for India's emissions at a broad level, let's look at them sector-wise, starting with the energy sector. The energy sector's emissions intensity of GDP has reduced by nearly 6% over the past decade. Our energy intensity of GDP has also gone down significantly, while our emissions intensity of energy has increased. So what we can see is that this increase in emissions intensity of energy has been compensated for by the reduction in energy intensity of GDP and has led to an overall reduction in emissions intensity of GDP. If you look over at our emissions intensity of energy for the energy sector, you'll see that we've been growing at the CAGR of about 17% over the 2005 to 15 period. The main drivers for this change are transport and public electricity generation, which is abbreviated here as PEG. In the PEG subsector, coal has always been the most significant, taking up a 76% share in 2015. Between 2007 and 2011, uh, the share of natural gas consumption increased, and so the relative share of coal consumed reduced, but later picked up again after 2012. In the transport sector, greenhouse gas emissions have doubled, but emissions intensity of energy has stayed more or less constant. Looking at public electricity generation now, our NDC target for fossil-free install capacity is 40% by 2030. Since 2005, our overall fossil-free install capacity has increased from 38 gigawatts to 86 gigawatts. As of 2015, we had achieved about 31% install capacity. Owing to an increased pen penetration of renewables, fuel shifts, and energy efficiency measures, our grid emission factor has reduced gradually to 0.87 kg CO2e per kilowatt hour. This number is expected to further reduce with policies that are currently in place to increase RE capacity by 2022. So let's look at transport now. Emissions in the transport sector are driven primarily by road transport. If you look at the graph on the left, you'll see that there was a massive increase in the number of registered passenger vehicles between 2005 and 2015, which is nearly quadrupled. This correspondingly has caused emissions from the transport sector to nearly double. Another contributing factor to our increase in emissions intensity is the group of subsectors referred to as other sectors by the IPCC. This comprises residential, commercial, agricultural, and fisheries-related energy. If you look at the activities that contribute to GHG emissions from the other sectors, you'll find that cooking accounts for over 90% of it. Over the past decade, partly due to governmental push towards LPG and cleaner cooking, as well as improved access to LPG, biomass consumption for cooking has reduced, and LPG consumption has nearly doubled. LPG consumption in absolute terms is still much lower than biomass because it's a more efficient fuel. But since biomass is considered carbon neutral and LPG is a fossil fuel whose emissions factor is much higher than biomass's, the emissions intensity of energy of the cooking sector has increased overall, despite the fact that cooking has become cleaner in terms of indoor air pollution. In conclusion, 
2005 is significant to our emissions inventory because it's the baseline year for most of our emissions reduction targets. Between 2005 and 2015, growth in emissions from the power sector reduced because of a conscious shift towards low carbon technologies. With this in mind, we'd like to bring your attention to two points. One, there are many policies at the national level post-2015 that are aligned with our NDC targets, which could significantly alter how our emissions look in the future. And two, sectors like PEG and transport need to be focused on and decarbonized in order for us to be able to achieve our NDC targets. Thank you. Thank you, Purnima. I now request Tirtha Biswas from CEEW to present his insights about the manufacturing sector emission estimates. Tirtha Biswas is a policy analyst at the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, working on the development of sustainable and competitive pathways for Indian industry to support its low carbon growth aspirations. At the Council, his research revolves around mineral resource security, greenhouse gas emissions and energy efficiency of the domestic industrial sector in India. Over to you, Tirtha. Thank you, Mur. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So this is Tirtha here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the broad level trends which we have observed in the manufacturing sector emission estimates. So uh, if I talk about the approach, so just uh, sector emission estimates, we used a bottom-up approach, uh, look, looking at MF energy consumption reported by more than 80 plus fuel types and across uh, more than 2 million uh, manufacturing enterprises. So uh, the primary source of our data was the annual survey of industries as published by the Ministry of, Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, MOSPI. So without further ado, I'm gonna take you through the um, numbers that we have found. Uh, Mernin, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, if you look at the uh, if you look at the emissions, the industrial sector emissions increased from 348, 41 million tons in two thousand five to six thirty five million tons in fifteen, increasing with a CAGR of six point four percent. At a sectoral level, what we found the two big sectors are iron, steel, and non metallic minerals, primarily cement, are almost equally contributing to the uh, emission industrial emissions. In uh, terms of type of emissions. Industrial emissions is primarily driven by NFA use, which is again, which is the bulk of it is primarily catered by coal, which is responsible for more than 80% of fuel use emissions. Whereas in terms of IPQ emissions, majority of the emissions are driven by the cement products, the process emissions involved in the cement production. Next slide, please. Okay. So, uh, in terms of the various trends and drivers, we mainly focused on the energy use emissions, and uh, and while we looked at the national level, also looked at different sub subsectoral level. So, I'm going to start with the emissions intensity uh, at, at the national level uh, um, and, and at the economic uh, at the overall industrial level. What we saw is the uh, intensity decreased with a CAGR of two percent. That roughly amounts to a net decrease of 13% compared to 2007 numbers. Now, you, you might be seeing why we are starting 2007 because emissions intensity uh, are typically, you see a lot of fluctuations because we are looking at uh, tons of CO2 per million of INA expenditure units. So, what we have done is we have used a three year moving average to normalize that. Now, at a subsectoral level, what we saw is the non metallic mineral sector, which is cement, and non ferrous mineral sector show the largest decrease in the emissions intensity. Whereas the only particular one sector that shows an increase is iron steel. Now emission intensity is hard to understand without analyzing the drivers of it. So what we have done is we have looked at carbon intensity of the fuel which the sectors are consuming and and the energy efficiency of the processes from, from the sector. Uh, next slide please. So we're looking at the carbon intensity uh, which has been expressed as tons of CO2 per TOE uh, at, the, at the overall industrial level has remained invariant, which roughly amounts to a 1% increase over the time period. Uh, at a subsectoral level, we saw two sectors standing out, which is chemicals, which decreased at a rate of minus 10%. The reason for a decrease of chemical sector is what we found out is the increasing share of gas, natural gas in the, in the sector's energy mix. Whereas for food and beverage sector, 
the increase in m carbon density is primarily because they are more reliance on coal as a as a principal source of energy demand next slide please yeah so in terms of energy intensity what we have seen is a very similar pattern with the emissions intensity and also it, it explains right if you if your carbon intensity remains constant the only thing that's changing your emission intensity is energy intensity so at the national level again we see a similar cag of 2% and a net decrease of minus 14% and as, and whereas again similar over here we are seeing a non metallic minerals standing out uh, showing the highest decrease of uh, energy intensity improvements followed by wood and beverage sector and iron steel sector again is the only sector that showed an increase now one may argue that uh, that the national uh, the bureau of energy efficiency has implemented the pat scheme during the later period which is from 2012 to 2015 and pat also covered iron steel sector now uh, why don't we see a impact of pat so to explain the uh, the reason uh, can i go to next slide please so one possible explanation that we found that have seen over here is a low coverage of pat industries that that is a possible uh, the re primary reason why you, we are not seeing the impact of pat on the entire industrial sector now uh, over here i am put i have put out the uh, data uh, from the annual survey of industries uh, basic uh, this is uh, basically a cumulative energy uh, energy consumption graph where number of factories is on the y axis and and the cumulative energy consumption is on the y axis now uh the out of the four sectors the only sector where pad covered around 80% of the sectors total energy is non ferrous metals how about if you if we go back and recall in terms of share of energy consumed across the industrial sector non ferrous metals has a very small share the largest sector which in terms of share contributing consuming around 40% of industrial energy is iron steel sector now if we look at the pad targets using the spat threshold of 30000 toe per year the pat is only able to cover less than 40% of the total sectors energy this is one of the primary reason why pat efficiency improvements are not been reflected uh, so one major limitation towards extending the pat targets and cover the entire industry, industries is if you move higher up the the incremental energy consumption covered by increasing number of factories becomes very marginal and as a result of that it in, it increases your transaction cost significantly now one possible way to reduce that is to promote policies that incentivizes or promotes switch switch to more cleaner source of energy for the industrial sector especially when we are seeing the carbon intensity of the of the entire industrial sector remain in unvariant in the period Thank you. Over to you, Malin. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sirta. Yeah. Next, we invite Nikhil Kolse Patel of Iglai South Asia to present an analysis of the base sector. Nikhil Kolse Patel uh, plays a key role in implementation of energy and climate mitigation projects at Iglai. Nikhil has diverse experience in the development of GHG inventories at the state and city level. He is a certified urban GHG inventory specialist under World Bank City Climate Planner Certificate Program. Nikhil has managed the preparation of national and state level emission estimates and analytical publications on behalf of ICLE, the waste sector lead under the GHG India Platform Initiative. Over to you, Nikhil. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'll be giving some insights on the waste sector and the uh, three sub sectors uh, that. Uh, there in uh, within that uh, that solid waste uh, domestic wastewater and industrial wastewater uh, next slide please so in terms of the overall estimation uh, the emissions from the waste sector are around 97 million tons of co2 equivalent and uh, the major contributor is uh, we've seen that it's domestic wastewater all through the time period consider uh, industrial wastewater contributes to around the one fourth of the emissions and solid waste makes about 12 percent. Uh, in terms of the growth, uh, industrial wastewater, uh, we've observed that the growth rate of emissions is the highest in that and followed by solid waste uh, disposal. Uh, again, uh, here uh, there is also there have been challenges in terms of gaps of information. So uh, some of this is also dependent on the uh, data that we have used for the uh, estimation. Uh, 
in terms of the overall trend of the waste sector as such, uh, the trend is quite steady all across the period and uh, we've seen a growth of around 4.2 CHER and emissions have overall grown by uh, 1.5 times as compared to uh, 2005 uh, when you're looking at 2015. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, in terms of gas waste emissions, uh, so domestic wastewater, uh, when it's discharged into uh, open uh, water bodies, that uh, that produces some amount of N2 emissions. So uh, that's a small portion of the emissions, mainly from the waste sector. CH4 emissions dominate in making make up about 75% of the emissions. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, how the waste sector fares in the, uh, with regards to uh, emission intensity, so uh, that is something we've looked at. And uh, overall, we've seen that the intensity, uh, emission intensity uh, cumulatively has decreased by 22%. Uh, so that uh, basically aligns with our uh, national targets uh, over, that we have under the NDC and uh, year on year uh, we've seen a change of around 2.4 percent. Uh, in terms of per capita emissions these are rising uh, so per capita uh, the population growth per year has been around 1 to 1.5 percent in that range in this period and uh, the emissions are rising at a faster rate but uh, there are also some of the drivers uh, that uh, we think uh, will also lead to further uh, reduction in the emission intensity, particularly or overall in the rate of growth of emissions. Uh, I'll get to that in the next two slides. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, solid waste, one interesting uh, observation that we got out of the analysis was uh, for solid waste, uh, when you're computing emissions, you have to go back uh, to a period 50 years before the starting point. So uh, we had to estimate emissions right from uh, 1950s. And uh, one interesting point that came out is uh, based on the changing waste composition in India uh, across cities. Uh, so that has impacted the emissions that are generated by every ton of solid waste. That's increased by around 2.6 times. So uh, that is that presents a challenge and an opportunity as well. Uh, uh, and we have also seen that uh, uh, based on the Swachh Bharat mission, if uh, you do an analysis, uh, so uh, currently uh, there's a gap, a large gap in processing of uh, solid waste. Only around 15% of uh, municipal solid waste in the country is processed. Uh, and the rest goes to uh, disposal sites. So, uh, but given the targets in the Swachh Bharat mission, so if those targets are achieved, the trend of emission is completely reversed. Uh, also, uh, given that we have got an increasing trend, but uh, as I said earlier, there are some challenges in the data. So, in terms of availability of information uh, on solid waste, it's processing, uh, that, that, that's intermittent, and that's why it's. Uh, uh, it is somewhat challenging to capture the impacts accurately. Uh, but overall, uh, uh, the main takeaway here is uh, given the focus uh, that has been put on segregation and processing of organic waste in particular uh, through programs like the Swatch Fire Mission. So the trend is that the emissions will, uh, if the activity there on continues, uh, the emissions will also uh, show reduction. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of uh, wastewater uh, emissions from the domestic sector, that's from households, uh, we looked at urban and rural areas. Uh, and uh, mainly for the domestic wastewater, uh, the emissions are largely dependent on the wastewater treatment and conveyance systems. Uh, so based on the how, how much percentage of the population uses a particular system like uh, septic tanks, like uh, uh, STP sewer line. So, uh, depending on that, there's a emission factor of, uh, assigned, or there's an emission factor specified for each, and the emission will depend on that. Uh, so, what we observe is uh, urban per capita emissions from domestic wastewater, particularly, they are slightly higher than rural. Uh, uh, so, that the main uh, driver here is uh, again because. Uh, 
in rural areas there's a lot of untreated discharge and uh, in terms of ghg emission that has a lower emission potential but of course there are other uh, other impacts as well uh, if uh, you're just plainly looking at the untreated discharge of water uh, so uh, wastewater sorry uh, and uh, that's why considering urban emissions are higher that is also happening because uh, when you uh, convey uh, wastewater through uh, two stps through uh, two sewage treatment plants like aerobic and anaerobic treatment plants uh, there is high uh, there is a higher methane generation but then th uh, that also gives an opportunity for methane capture uh, and that is the main opportunity that is also there uh, to decarbonize emissions from uh, industry in both industrial and domestic wastewater uh, there is a need to focus on uh, CH4 recovery and also anaerobic treatment, which can enable uh, these mitigation actions. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that's it from you. Um, thank you, Nikhil. I now invite Dr. Raman Mehta Vasudha Foundation to present his insights from the agriculture, forestry, and other land use or the FOLU sector. Over to you, Dr. Raman. Um, Dr. Raman uh, Mehta is a pro program policy head at Vasudha Foundation, New Delhi. He has worked on different facets of sustainable development, climate change, and natural resource management. Um, he currently focuses on issues relating to equity in the context of climate change, integration of climate change concerns into development strategies, and how to overcome barriers in accelerating the deployment of renewable energy sources in the country. Over to you, Dr. Raman. Uh, thanks. Uh, so <clears throat> the story of the AFOLU sector as opposed to the other sectors is that uh, overall the trends uh, of emissions from the AFOLU sector uh, uh, are flat in the sense that there is not much difference between the emissions uh, in 2005 and 2015. If anything, emissions in 2015 are a little lower than emissions in 2005. So what you see in the FLU sectors in terms of emission trends is a flat trajectory. Uh, and, the, uh, and the three major contributors to positive emissions, or rather I should say two major contributors to the positive emissions from the FLU sector are the livestock sector and uh, aggregate sources and non-CO2 emissions uh, from land which is primarily rice cultivation in India's case. Uh, while in terms of land or emissions from land, the primary sort of uh, 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 emission removal is being done by the forestry sector. And there are very small emissions from the uh, other land use uh, in India. Next slide, please. So uh, in terms of the livestock sector, uh, primarily, again, the uh, main, main contributor to uh, uh, emissions in this sector is indirect fermentation, uh, with you know, the main driver there being uh, a very large size of uh, animal population in India. I think the Indian animal population is probably the largest in the world. Uh, and uh, dominated by uh, uh, cattle, which are the primary sort of sources of indirect fermentation. Uh, what's happened over the years is that there's been a stagnation in the uh, population of, uh, in the livestock population of India, which is why you find that uh, the indirect fermentation emissions are again flat, uh, but, uh, uh, there's been a long standing sort of uh, attempt even for not for climate uh, sort of reasons but for other environmental reasons to try and limit uh, flock sizes but that's sort of not really been successful and the schemes that have been uh, 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 that have been deployed by the government have not succeeded in limiting flock sizes although growth of the animal populations has been uh, stagnant uh, between 2005 and 2015. Next slide, please. Uh, like I had already uh, pointed out earlier, 
that the land story in india is dominated by the fact that the forestry sector is a major uh, co2 removal a remover uh, and uh, that sort of overwhelms the very small amount of uh, positive emissions coming from assorted land use in croplands forestlands grasslands etc uh, what's uh, what's uh, notable about the forestry emissions uh, in the indian context is that uh, they have again been fairly steady uh, if anything uh, if you rely on official figures the uh, carbon dioxide removal has uh, gone up uh, between uh, you know starting from uh, 2014 uh, but uh, they remained fairly steady through the uh, reference period from uh, between 2005 to 2015 next slide please so uh, what we have in the uh, in, in the you know in the trends that are again coming out like again the dominant so story here is that stagnant emissions fairly stagnant emissions Uh, and a flat curve. Uh, the main contributor uh, being rice, and the other sort of contributor being agriculture soils, primarily from uh, fertilizer use. Uh, so those those are the emissions that are uh, getting captured from the category uh, which is termed as agricultural soils. Uh, India, as you all know, is a uh, is among the largest rice producers uh, in the world. fertilizer use has been you know per per acre fertilizer use is uh, in india still fairly low but it's been rising and therefore a slight sort of growing trend uh, of uh, you know uh, emissions from the agriculture soils uh, but in general uh, uh, it's a it's a fairly flat sort of picture now in terms of the policy sort of uh, implications i think uh, uh one one uh, aspect that needs to be pointed out is that india's uh, emission intensity target that india proposed or put forth in uh, copenhagen of reducing energy uh, emission intensity of the gdp uh, uh, you know by 20 to 25% uh, between 2005 and 2020 and then extended that to 20 uh, you know to 2030 in the uh, ndcs that were uh that were submitted to the paris uh, uh meeting of the unfccc is that india explicitly stated that agriculture will be kept out of uh, this particular uh, offer uh, at the international level so uh, there are no specific as yet uh, policies that look at limiting uh, emissions from agriculture except perhaps you could say that there was the agriculture mission uh, that was uh, uh, identified as a priority in the na national uh, uh, in the national uh, action plan on uh, climate change but uh, the agriculture mission subsequently uh, was uh, when it got uh, uh, when it got operationalized uh, was a very very small component Uh, and it wasn't even titled that it, uh, eventually it was called uh, the national uh, uh, national initiative on climate resilient agriculture uh, and addressed a very small part of the whole problem relating to agriculture the other uh, mission of course was the green india mission and uh, the green india mission as you all know even the bur for example admits that uh, uh, we are not on track to meet our uh, commitments under the or our or our uh, targets under the green india mission but uh, uh, i am not going into that in detail at the moment because the the uh, uh, the you know publicly available information uh, around the national agriculture mission is uh, sort of not not very clear and therefore we haven't uh, ventured to do an analysis of that at this stage uh, I think that's it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, that's it from my side. Thanks very much. 
Thank you, Dr. Raman. The World Resource Institute has been the peer reviewer for this exercise. Subrata Chakraparti from WRI will detail the reviewer's perspective on methodology and approach for this exercise. Subrata is a manager with the climate program at WRI. He primarily works on the GHG platform India. His role includes reviewing the methodology notes and estimates for various sectors such as the AFOLU, energy, industrial energy use and IPPU and waste. He also leads the data related research for GHGDP and is also involved in the electric mobility work at WRI India. Over to you, Subrata. Uh, thanks. Uh, I hope I am uh, audible. Uh, uh, yes, you are. Thanks, thanks. Uh, so, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You know, uh, I I hope you have enjoyed so far uh, the key insights that uh, that our partners have provided for each uh, each uh, sectors, each key economic sectors. Uh, so, the, as uh, you know, WRI WRI India is involved as a technical advisor and peer reviewer uh, to this platform, and and as a part of our role, we sort of developed a framework for you know, GHG estimates, uh, which which basically involves uh, preparation of guidance document in line with the internationally accepted uh, guidance and the reporting templates, uh, which is consistent with the reporting requirements, which is consistent with the reporting requirements of, uh, of UNFCCC. Uh, next slide, please. So basically, why 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 should we care about uh, you know GHG estimates and and uh, you know, if you if you understand the viewership of the GHG estimates, is basically not a geographical profile. And when it is not uh, really limited to a country's geographical profile, it it you know uh, warrants few questions, uh, uh, which are basically whether the GHG estimates are credible and transparent, whether it fulfills the requirements of uh, reporting as per UNFCCC, where does the country lacks information to create robust GHG estimates and support. You know policy decisions. Uh, what are the priorities for research and measurement? Any scientific uncertainties in the emissions? So, so, so these are few questions uh, which basically requires uh, you know a third party review. Uh, next slide, please. So, so as per the decision 17th of eighth session of COP, each non-mixed party needs to communicate inventory of anthropogenic emissions. Uh, by source and removal by sinks of all greenhouse gases, uh, which are not controlled under Montreal Protocol. So GHG estimates that are prepared under this platform informs the national government, which can help meet the reporting requirement internationally. Uh, it also helps in building uh, sort of national capacities and capabilities by bringing out the improvement areas uh, in the in the inventorization. It also helps with the you know regular preparation of uh, Biannual reports in accordance with the relevant decisions under the UNFCCC process. Uh, as as it has already been mentioned, that uh, GHG platform India and its analysis have been uh, recognized uh, in the second BUR of India, which is an official submission by Government of India to UNFCCC. Uh, next slide, please. So this is how we did. Uh, you know, understanding the importance of consistency in reporting. Uh, we sort of devised a guidance document and a reporting template by creating a GHG matrix, which is further divided into two parts. Uh, as you can see from the slide, national and subnational, as well as sectoral. And then uh, we identified the components for each part and came up with the guidance and these are reduced uh, as far as practicable. We use consistent accounting approaches, data collection methods, included all significant GHG uh, uh, greenhouse gases sources and sinks uh, in the in the in the GHG assessment boundary and we particularly disclosed and justify any specific exclusions ensured common methodologies uh, data sources assumptions etc and we used uh, publicly available data uh, and the recent data and updated our estimates in light of the new credible sources uh, next slide please so this is this slide basically explains as to how uh, the review process works under uh, under GHG platform India. So all the partners submit their GHG emissions along with the methodology group, uh, which transparently mentions the methodology adopted to calculate GHG emissions trend analysis along with the supporting documents. 
these documents go through a routine check, what we call it as first layer review. Uh, this is a first extensive check of activity data and mission factor and underlying assumptions and identify potential improvements, which is then communicated to the sector leads. Uh, once we receive the revised documentation with improvements, it goes for second layer review, which is an independent technical review. If there is any further room of improvements, it goes for another round of iteration with the sectoral leads and the team. The revised and the improved document after satisfactory peer review process then goes to the editorial check before finalization and uploading at the GG official website, GGPI official website. Next slide, please. So to paint an accurate picture of, of GHG estimates, you know, it is important to have more stratified activity data, country or plant specific emission factors. But uh, there are few key source categories, you know, like, uh, like electricity generation, etc. cetera. Uh, Statewise data for higher tier as per, you know, IPCC is not available in the public domain. So data accessibility is again an issue there are data that are necessary but not available at the desired level of segregation and all these above points actually boils down to two uh, two common things one is the need to have institutional arrangement for data collection and second uh, capacity building so so the national gng estimates is basically more than just a part of national communication it should be viewed more as an analytical tool which could inform on appropriate policy measures to be taken in order to achieve national climate goals and also to track the progress of the climate policies. Uh, there are a lot of discussions around the data sets uh, that are used to determine GHG estimates at the national and subnational level. We at platform level uh, like to quantify the uncertainties associated with activity data and the emission factor going, going forward. Uh, we would also like to approach adopting higher tier methods to refine our GHG estimates further and would like to get involved with external sectoral experts as well. Uh, we'd very much like to conduct this technical assessment of GHG estimates in line with the UNFCCC guidelines. Last but not the least, a quality GHG estimates uh, basically informs the reader and make him understand the assumptions and the calculations. Uh, I guess that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Suprata and all the panelists. Uh, we now open the webinar to questions from the audience. Please direct questions to the panelists using the Q&A chat window. The first question we have um, is uh, directed to Tirtha. Uh, you mentioned that coal-based production in key industrial sectors has been a major driver for industrial emissions. Given the profile of India's iron and steel industry, what is the scope of electrification and cleaner processes in the future? Hi. So, posing the question. Uh, so I'm, I want to start with, if, uh, let's say you divide the iron steel sector into two broad sectors, like, let's say iron making and steel making. Now if you look at the recent technologies, so steel making is in India is electrified. So you have electric arc furnaces and you have induction furnaces. Whereas the iron making process is heavily driven by coal, which is primarily your glass furnaces, which is which are typically the characteristics uh, of a integrated steel plant, followed by the DRI, which is again producing sponge irons. Uh, typically, these are small scale and often belong to the medium and small scale industries as well. So, uh, and, the, and, and the, given the per capita levels of steel that India consumes today, it's, it's highly likely that we need more fresh iron, processed iron to be pumped in, into the economy. That brings up the question that what are the how can we or what are the pathways to decarbonize or let's say switch to low carbon iron making so as of now that if the, the, the typical processes that have been explored are gas which did not pick up much in india because of our uh, priorities and and pricing strategies so yes we need to have re revive the gas based uh, plants mm -hmm. Following by uh, this, uh, Tata Steel uh, uses a, 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 a very low, a typical technology which uh, which uses a cyclone, uh, a dense media cyclone to, to convert iron into uh, uh, to reduce iron ore and into iron. Uh, it's called a Helsa Nana process. So uh, it's typically used uh, kind of in Norway, but whereas uh, in India it's yet to be tested out. That also the, the, uh, kind of leaves the room for uh, post-potential testing and uh, kind of looking at feasibility where I can make, 
used in the, in the uh, Indian applications. And finally, if you look at how European Union and uh, Japan's transition to is a hydrogen-based economy, uh, more than um, more than three uh, pilot projects are looking at whether they can use hydrogen to reduce iron to produce steel. So even uh, CEW has done a very uh, initial assessment, uh, mostly looking at the technical economic feasibility of a, of a hydrogen-based uh, uh, iron steel production process. Thank you. Anyways, I'll be happy to take uh, take more questions offline if you have many, any specific uh, questions regarding those processes. Yeah, over to you, Merlin. Thanks, Sirta. There is a follow-up question. Uh, did you consider emissions of fluorinated gases from IPPO categories, uh, fluorochemical production, two uh, B nine, electronics production, two E, or ODS substitutes, two F, in your IPPO estimates? If yes, what were your sources of data? Uh, no, we are our, our scope was limited only to CO two, CH four, and N two O. We did not include those uh, F gases in the emission estimates. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, uh, what is the typical percentage of residue burning in India, especially in major crops such as paddy wheat, cotton and groundnuts? Um, no, uh, they haven't specified anybody, but I guess Vasudha Foundation can answer this question. Dr. Raman? Sorry, I was on a mute this thing. Sorry. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the question, Suresh. Um, uh, so, uh, the first thing about residue burning is that there are no surveys or there are no sort of, there is no officially collected data of the proportion of crop residues that are burned uh, in India. There, there are some expert studies that have been done uh, and the two studies that we have relied on uh, are Gadde et al. and Jan et al. And uh, from these two studies, basically, the... the uh, uh, estimates that come out are that in Punjab, Haryana, UP and Himachal Pradesh, around 23% of the wheat residues are burnt, uh, while in the rest of the country, about 10% of the wheat residues are burnt. For rice, the country average for residue burning is uh, 20%, and for cotton, uh, the residue burning uh, is about 10%, and this is for the whole country. And, you know, these, uh, these scientists have made certain assumptions on the basis of which they came up with these numbers. We don't, I don't think we have any uh, figures for groundnut uh, residue burning. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Dr. Raman. Um, next question is also directed to Dr. Raman. Can you please elaborate on why rice production in specific has higher emissions in comparison with any other food grains? Well, so Primarily, rice cultivation results in methane emissions, and this is uh, again typically uh, sort of uh, emissions that arise out of uh, conventional transplanted rice in uh, you know uh, uh, in in flat land, where uh, again typically uh, farmers tend to uh, 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 you know flood their fields and keep them sort of filled with water through the crop cycle. And so when the plant matter in the field uh, sort of decays in the water, then that gives rise to methane emissions. So uh, that's the reason why, uh, <clears throat> why uh, 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 you have uh, emissions from rice cultivation. My side. Thank you, Dr. Raman. Um, next question. Um, how can one include below ground microbial processes for GHG accounting for agricultural soils? I'm not sure who this question is directed to. No, I think it's for me. Okay. Uh, so, so I think. See, the problem is that in a lot of these cases, there aren't, there isn't enough primary scientific work that has been done to, uh, uh, to estimate, you know, what is the level of uh, below ground microbial sort of matter. Uh, 
uh, for agriculture soils the second part of it is that in very heavily for example if you if you are looking at crop land and heavily cultivated crop land a lot of the microbial matter tends to sort of die out because of application of fertilizers and pesticides and so on and so forth uh, and uh, uh, below ground my although uh, what i must say is that the forest survey of india estimates uh, below ground biomass uh, when they when they do inventory of uh, uh, you know uh, forest sort of uh, carbon dioxide removals by the forest uh, uh, by, by forests but uh, i i am not sure whether there are any primary studies uh, or primary studies that are in the public domain that are looking that uh, and looking at this particular aspect uh, specifically um thank you the next question um is also not directed to anyone specific does collecting information about emissions include information about the utility of emissions economic value generated gdp contribution per unit emissions etc for different activities or sectors how far are we from such a system would either vasudha or wri like to take up this question yeah i can take this on so you see the point is that there is a whole lot of uh, estimation that is being done about the utility or economic value of the the specific uh, economic activities uh, that are being carried out so for us to estimate that also would be would be uh, you know Uh, uh, uh sort of reinventing the wheel so for example just to give you an example uh, india has a pretty extensive system of uh, estimating its gdp and its gdp growth and so on and so forth from economic activity so what we are looking at is uh, trying to complement those efforts and uh, trying to uh, uh, estimate uh, gdp emissions are ar arising out of those particular economic activities and you can marry the two databases so for example when we are putting out the numbers on emission intensity of india's gdp that in a sense is a is a combination that comes out of our estimations of ghg emissions from economic activity and the gdp numbers that the government of india puts out so i hope that sort of uh, answers your question thank you um the last question we have one last question how can we estimate ghg emissions from sub sectors of msw i think ikle can answer this yeah thank you uh, so in terms of uh, the sub sectors uh, so i imagine uh, this means the different processing uh, pathways so what we have included for now is uh, emissions from disposal of msw in uh, disposal sites or landfills so there is the ipcc methodology for all the organic uh, constituents there is a certain methane generation potential which you can estimate uh, based on and use uh, information on waste generation uh, its composition uh, and so on uh, for the other uh, routes uh, basically which is uh, composting biomethanation and any other waste to energy technologies uh, so there are uh, again there are uh, equations and uh, there is calculation methodologies for that that is available we have not included that as of now but uh, that is mainly because of the data that is needed for this it's not really available uh, consistent and reliable data is not available in the english context on this also given that waste to energy uh, we have seen it emerge only uh, probably since 2012 or so and uh, even for that the data that you need uh, in terms of how much waste is processed in these uh, different routes that is uh, still sketchy but it is uh, definitely possible uh, the ipcc also has uh, the ipcc guidelines also include uh, the methodology for this thank you um that brings us to the end of this webinar uh, thank you all of you for joining us today a special thanks to our panelists you can find more information on the work by ghg platform india on um, info@ghgplatform-india.org or uh, write to the secretariat at the rate ghg platform 
india dash india dot org the email ids and links are available on the presentation on the screen uh, do write to us thank you all for joining us